Hello, everyone, as you come into the room. Thanks for making the time to join us this evening. My name is Michael. I'm the events coordinator and publicist at Annie Bloom's Books. For those of you who aren't familiar with the store, we're located in Southwest Portland, Oregon, in the heart of Multnomah Village. We've been around for 43 years now. We're open on weekdays from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. and weekends, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Our website is always open. You can shop day and night at anniebloom's.com. You can go into the chat right now and click on that link to buy Miriam's book. We would really appreciate you buying the book from us. Uh, we offer curbside pickup, in-store pickup, local delivery, a couple of different shipping options for those of you who aren't nearby or just want the convenience. We have uh, some great events coming up on Tuesday, the 31st. We'll have our first in-store event in you know over two years. Uh, Portland Northwest, or sorry, Pacific Northwest author Emiko Jean, in-store reading from her new YA novel, Tokyo Dreaming. It's a sequel to Tokyo Ever After that came out, I think, last year. On Tuesday, June 28th, another in-store event, children's author Trudy Ludwig, reading from her new picture book, Brave Every Day. Tonight, we have local author Miriam Forster with a reading and PowerPoint presentation and uh, talking about sharks. For her, from her new book for middle grade readers, Sharks, A Mighty Bitey History, which is such a great title. It's a beautiful book. I saw it for the first time last couple of days. It's, it's big and pretty. You'll want to buy it. Oh, pretty. <laughs> There's gonna be a Q&A at the end. So feel free to type your questions in the chat and I can read them, or you can click on the little hand icon, or you can just come on the screen and ask a question since a small group of you. Let me tell you about uh, Sharks, A Mighty Bitey History. They're some of the oldest creatures on the earth, or rather in its waters. This epic survey follows sharks from their earliest appearance in the Paleozoic era up through the challenges they face today. Along the way, readers will meet many different sharks from different points in history. They'll get an up-close evolutionary look at what makes a shark a shark, like their skin, their teeth, their fins, and more. And they'll get a crash course in archaeological time as the book mostly covers prehistoric sharks or modern day sharks who have been around much longer than humans. Like the hammerhead has been patrolling tropical coastlines for more than 20 million years. That's uh, a long tenure. With much illustrations read. from Gordy Wright, really nice, and meticulous research from author Miriam Forster, Sharks and Mighty Buddy History is sure to delight shark lovers, science fans, and any reader who loves to discover new wonders about the world around them. Miriam Forster loves science, history, and animals, especially the weird prehistoric ones. She's been a, a waiter, a barista, a daycare worker, a bookseller, yay. And she is currently an author of young adult fiction and a fact checker for children's books. Forster lives in Oregon with her husband, a child, and a grumpy old cat. Miriam Forster. Hello. Hello. Um, I am very happy to see you guys. Hello. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how I came to write the book. And well, first you have to see it because again, again, because look at it, it's so pretty. And it looks like this. Um, whoa, come back. Computer. Um, how I came to write the book. And then we're going to talk about how we know the Megalodon is extinct because this is pretty fun. So um, when I was in my early 20s, I decided that I wanted to be a writer. So I went and took some writing classes by mail. And um, I took a novel writing class, a basic novel writing class. I took um, like a short uh, fiction class, child, and it was specifically kids lit, uh, short fiction kids lit class. And, uh, and I took a nonfiction kids lit class uh, for short nonfiction, like the kind of stuff you'd see in highlights or like, um, I don't even know if they still have them back in the day or now, but like back in the day, you know, you had these magazines that had like all these facts and stuff, and, um, like history and science. And I know Ranger Rick is still around. Excellent. Um, but I loved the nonfiction class. I loved it. And I really wanted to do more of it. The problem was, is that when you go to these magazines and you say, how do I submit my stuff? It's like, okay, um, they're like, da da da, list your, and then they say, you know, you know, send us this, send us that. And then they were like, and list your credentials. And me being the literal minded person that I am, uh, decided that uh, list your credentials 
meant that you had to have some kind of credentials to write nonfiction for children. And that is not true. Um, it's not necessarily that I have no credentials. Um, I never, uh, I ran, I was, uh, thought went, um, I had run out of money to go to school. So I was like, well, no credentials, right? Um, and then in, I want to say 2000, possibly 17, um, possibly later, I went to a writer's um, get together with an editor friend of mine. And she was talking, one of the things she was talking about to the writers was the nonfiction kind of renaissance that's happening here because Common Core requires, um, like, like teachers have a lot of nonfiction books and a lot of nonfiction books are kind of older. They're a little like, some of them are out of date and, or like not particularly interesting. Uh, so there's been like this big kind of upsurge in the need for new nonfiction books. And I was like, well, do you have to have like a degree or be an expert to write the nonfiction books? And she said, no. And I said, excellent. And I said, I'm gonna write something about prehistoric sharks. <laughs> And she said, that sounds great, go do that. And I did. Um, I ended up, we ended up selling it to Abrams who decided that it would be a good addition to their uh, oversized history books. They have the history of bees and the history of trees. And now we have the history of sharks. So um, that's kind of how I got started. But I, the other thing that was kind of happening was that I developed this really the reason I picked prehistoric sharks was I developed this really big fondness um, for shark attack movies. I have a big collection of them. And just the really goofy ones, right? Like Mega Shark versus the Giant Octopus, right? Um, and I just love a, a big shark. You know, I love a big, a big munchy shark. I like Jaws 3, which I realize doesn't say a lot for me, um, but it's just hilarious. So when I started writing, I was super excited to find out about sharks. And of course, of course I had to include, I had to include, if you're gonna talk about prehistoric sharks, you gotta talk about the Megalodon, right? Let's talk about the Megalodon. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the Megalodon. <laughs> um, if I were to ask a random sampling of people, do you think the Megalodon is extinct? Uh, you'd get a fairly broad range of answers. Um, some people, including scientists, pretty much all scientists, would say, yes, it is extinct. Uh, some people would say, no, it's absolutely not extinct. Um, I don't know where they get that certainty. And most people would be kind of in the middle, right? Like, well, how do we know that it's, it's extinct? I mean, it's a big shark, but the ocean is a big place. Like, we discover stuff all the time, things go extinct and then they come back or we thought they were extinct and then we find them again is more accurate. They don't come back from extinction. Um, and so, you know, the question is, is like, how do we know? How do we know the Megalodon's extinct? How do we know it's not out there swimming around? And I'm gonna answer that question, but first I'm gonna tell you a couple stories. So this, First, I'm going to tell you the story of the coelacanth. Uh, the coelacanth is what's called the lobe-finned fish. Um, they're very, very old, oldest known fossil, 400 million years old. Um, they have eight fins. <laughs> they're um, and they have like super tough scales, um, and they were thought to be extinct uh, until 1938, when the first West Indian uh, ocean coelacanth was found in a fisherman's catch off the coast of South Africa. Um, the fisherman caught it. He said, what the heck is this? Apologies. 
and he sent it to a nearby um, museum and the museum went, what? And they sent a picture of it to a, an expert and the expert said, do not lose that. Sent back a telegram, do not lose the fish. Uh, this is important, that's a paraphrase. Um, they thought that this particular um, species of coelacanth was the only one that had survived. Uh, however, they did find an, the Indonesian coelacanth in a fish market in 1997. So there is a, they are two separate species. You can see on the map here, um, that is a fossil coelacanth. And you can see on the map here, the purple is the Indonesian coelacanth range and the red is the West Indian Ocean coelacanth range. Coelacanth habits. They can be over six and a half feet tall, which means they're taller than me, which is disturbing. Uh, they live in overhangs and caves in steep marine reefs between 500 and 800 feet down. They're nocturnal. They're a passive drift feeder. They eat cephalopods and fish. They're slow moving and slow aging, like the Greenland shark, which is in my book. You'll find out um, a lot of sharks that live in sharks that live in very, very cold water, like the Greenland shark or deep sea sharks. They tend to be very slow and they tend to age very slowly. Scientists think coelacanths can live to be about 100. Um, they don't actually hit reproductive maturity until they're 50, I think, or like 40 or 50. So um, it's a very, it's a very slow paced life. So the second one we're gonna talk about, so that's the coelacanth, thought it was extinct, it's not extinct. This is Lord Howe's stick insect. Uh, it is the rarest insect in the world. It was originally um, found on Lord Howe Island, which is between Australia and New Zealand. It's just a little crescent shape of island. Um, but the island, a uh, ship landed on the island that had a population of black rats. The island became infested with rats. The Lord Howe stick insect went extinct in the 1920s, or so we thought. This picture right below the Lord Howe stick insect is called Ball's Pyramid. Ball's Pyramid is part of the Lord Howe Island chain. It is ridiculous looking. I don't know how anybody goes up that, <clears throat> but people go up it. A dead specimen was found on Ball's Pyramid in 1964. So I said, oh, here is a dead Lord Howe stick insect. That's weird. They were supposed to have gone extinct. So in 2001, a team of scientists went and searched for it. And it took them a while. They found a population of 24 Lord Howe stick insects living under a single bush on a ledge on Ball's Pyramid. Do, 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 do. It grows to be about six inches long. They uh, pretty much just eat the one bush. That's as far as we, there are indications um, now that there might be more scattered populations on Bell's Pyramid. So it's possible they eat more than the tea tree bush they were found under, but that's basically what we know about their diet so far. They're also nocturnal. Um, they can reproduce via parthenogenesis, which is basically like making a clone of yourself. Um, the females, um, some females of different species can basically make themselves a clone uh, and get pregnant and give birth. There's some sharks can do that too, actually. Um, and they are currently being bred in zoos to reestablish a population on Lord Howe Island. They're gonna eradicate the rats. They're gonna bring back the stick insect. Um, so that's great. It's a success story. We thought they got wiped out. They didn't get wiped out. There they are. That little square, by the way, is where the Lord Howe Island chain is between Australia and New Zealand. So, here we see two success stories of things we saw were extinct that are not extinct. And they have some things in common. Um, they occupy very, very small areas, right? Um, they are nocturnal, which helps. And they also tend to live in places that humans don't often go. Humans don't often go 500 to 800 feet down off of these very specific places in the coast of South Africa. People don't often go to, uh, Ball's Pyramid and climb around. Um, so these are populations that went unnoticed for years and years, hundreds of years in the case of the coelacanth, uh, because they were out of the way and because they didn't really have a huge impact on the environment and they didn't, um, they didn't show up where people could see them. So Speaking of impact on the environment, let's talk about something that isn't extinct, but that we didn't see for a long time. The first giant squid was filmed alive in 2002, and the first one was filmed in the wild in 2005. Up till 2002, no one had ever recorded a live giant squid. But we knew 
that they existed. And the reason we knew they existed is because giant squid carcasses have been recorded since the mid 1800s. They've been found on every continent. Um, parts of giant squid have been found on the bellies of sperm whales and many sperm whales also bear the scars of fights with the giant squid. So we knew that the giant squid was a thing. We knew it was an animal. We knew where it lived. No one had ever seen it because the ocean is a deep and terrifying place. So with all of that information on how, like on these kinds of stories, what does that tell us about the Megalodon? Well, what? Oh, there we go. So let's talk about the Megalodon. Earliest fossils date to 20 million years ago. The Megalodon died out 3.6 million years ago. Not that long in geologic times. Um, they could be up to 60 feet long. Actually, a lot of movies, uh, sci-fi monster movies with Megalodon actually make them too big. Uh, I don't complain because they're goofy and I love them, but 60 feet was about the max, 59 feet was as far as we go. Um, they ate primarily whales, that will be important. Uh, they used coastal, we know they used coastal nursery areas like hammerheads do. Um, and they're not a deep sea fish. So I saw the Meg, I enjoyed the Meg. That's not how it works, okay. Uh, they're not a deep sea fish. They don't live in the Mariana Trench. They're a coastal fish. Um, they stayed in shallower coastal waters. Um, in fact, scientists suspect that cooling temperatures uh, contributed to their extinction as the earth got cooler and cooler. Uh, they didn't, they weren't able to adapt. And their favorite prey, whales, uh, grew blubber and moved north to get away from them, is one of the hypotheses. And hypothesis? Hypothesi. Hypothesis. Uh, whales grew, one of the ideas is that whales grew blubber and moved away from, moved north to get away from the megalodon. Um, and there just wasn't. There just wasn't enough food in the new colder oceans for them. And so they went extinct, it's very sad. How do we know? Fossil megalodon teeth have been found on every continent except Antarctica. No non-fossil megalodon teeth have ever been found. If the megalodon was alive today, first off, there'd have to be more than one of them. There's always, there's a reason why these movies only have one or two, okay? Because there'd have to be more than one of them. Uh, generally, like scientists think to maintain a population, you need about maybe 50 uh, more if you want to prevent genetic drift. Uh, but the Lord House Stick Insects made it to 24. So we're going to stick with 24. 24 megalodon. You have to have at least that in the ocean in order to sustain any kind of population at all. So 24 megalodon in the ocean, and no one has ever found a non fossilized megalodon tooth. Megalodon are just, we're just like other sharks. They lose their tooth at, sharks lose their teeth at an astonishing rate. They're the most common fossil. Um, like, certainly the most common kind of shark fossil, possibly one of the most common, common fossils in the world, or at least one of them. They are, there are so many fossil teeth that we find. Um, I, you can, so many shark teeth. You Shark teeth are everywhere. I went to a rock show this summer. I bought a box of shark teeth, like five of them for like a dollar, <laughs> like little ones. But like five shark teeth for a dollar at the rock show. Um, no one's ever, ever found a non-fossilized megalodon tooth. No megalodon carcasses have ever been found. If you'll notice the stories we told, there are, the, one of the first things that happens is you find the dead thing. And you say, oh, this dead thing does not look <laughs> like it's like a thing that should be here. You know, we find we find the coelacanth in the fish market. We found the Lord Howe stick insect, a dead one on the Falls Pyramid. We've been finding giant squid carcasses forever. You find the dead thing, and that helps you know that the live thing is still out there. No megalodon carcasses ever. And let's be real. If there was a giant shark in the ocean and somebody found its carcass and like anybody knew about it. Well, first of all, everyone would know about it. And secondly, like, you know that corporations 
and like people who profit off of like shark finning and stuff would go after it. <laughs> we just leave it in the ocean because humans don't do that. So no megalodon carcasses, no teeth, uh, no bite marks on other animals. No megalodon bite marks on other animals have ever been verified. Um, as we saw with the squid and the sperm whale, you can tell when an animal exists by the effect it has on other animals. It, nobody has ever found an animal and verified the animal with a megalodon bite mark in it, which uh, no megalodon eggs or young have ever been found, live eggs or young have ever been found. They used coastal nurseries, right? We're not finding tiny megalodon off the coast of California. Um, so we have all of these signs that we would see if they were still alive. Uh, and we haven't seen them. And again, like with the coelacanth and the stick insect, those ranges are really small. Megalodon ranges are not small. Megalodon were all over the world. And even if there were only 24 of them, that is a big fish. It has a big range. Um, the idea that they would be ranging all over the world and not be seen or leave any kind of physical evidence behind. Um, that's just not very realistic. And finally, the big reason we know that the megalodon extinct is that there's no sign of massive predator influence on the ocean. Um, big predators like this leave a mark in the ecosystem itself. And the food web isn't set up as if there was a giant predator in the ocean of this kind. And I will show you an example of what I mean. So what you're looking at here is on, well, I'm assuming it's your left. Uh, these are the ranges. These yellow splots are the ranges of the Megalodon in the late Miocene and Pliocene, which is the last half of its reign, I guess you could say. Uh, those yellowy orange spots are Megalodon like territory, I guess. Uh, geographical distribution. These are, the, these are the places where the Megalodon lived. Um, those look a little bit similar to the map on the right. If you'll notice, there's a lot of overlap and a lot of similarities. Um, especially like you'll notice uh, along the North American and South American coast, there's that blue streak there, um, there's a fair amount of stuff uh, in the Atlantic. Um, anyhow, those are what are known as whale superhighways. And they are the migration tracks of different kinds of whales. Now, if there were 24 giant predators that specifically and primarily eat whales in the ocean, living in those coastal areas, whale migration would not look like this. And a lot of these whale migrations are done with young. And if we had megalodon in any numbers in the ocean, whale migration with young would be like, it would be horrifying. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have ever seen uh, that planet Earth where the orcas like track the mother whale and her calf. Um, it's horrifying. Don't watch it if you have a, if you have a strong sense of sympathy for. Uh, but imagine, imagine something like the Megalodon, like running back and forth in a whale migration, like season eating baby whales. First of all, not only would we notice, we'd probably seen it. Do you know how many whale watchers there are in the world? Like somebody would have seen this or somebody would have noticed that something was eating all the baby whales. So this is not, so when you look at the movement of the prey, it is not the kind of ecosystem that would support this kind of predator. So what does that tell us? Other than the fact that I talk too fast. 
Case closed. Megalodon is not here. Megalodon is extinct, which is very sad, but we still have amazing sharks. We have big sharks. We have ferocious sharks. Um, we have glow in the dark sharks. We have amazing sharks today, but the Megalodon, the Megalodon is 110% for sure extinct, very extinct. Um, also, free bonus info, in this scene in the Meg, again, I love the movie, but in this scene in the Meg, Jason Statham isn't wearing fins. <laughs> um, and I don't know if you've ever tried to go scuba diving without fins. <laughs> it's, um, he's not going anywhere. So I don't know how he expected to swim away from the shark without fins. Uh, anyway, so that is my explanation on how we know the Megalodon is extinct. And that is my, oop, my PowerPoint. And I think I'm back. I think I'm back. Yeah. Okay. So, so we know the Megalodon is extinct, um, but theoretically there are some sharks that could still be around. Uh, for example, well, not this one. This is the Orthocanthus and this is a freshwater shark. And um, I mean, maybe it could be in the bayous of Louisiana occasionally eating people, but like, that's not likely because they'd have to share a niche with the, with the crocodilians. Uh, which is unlikely to go well for them. So we know that they're they're not around. But let's talk about this is a scamphorhynchus. And they are basically relatives of today's goblin sharks. Uh, so theoretically, the Amphorhynchus was a deep sea shark like the goblin shark. Um, theoretically, we could one day pull up a goblin shark, do a bunch of tests on it, and discover that it is in fact a Scamphorhynchus. That is possible uh, because like I said, deep sea sharks, they move slow, uh, they don't, they tend to kind of just chill, wait for food to come to them. Um, it'd be very easy to miss a deep sea shark. Uh, but the ocean doesn't really, before you go, oh, the megalodon could have become a deep sea shark. No, no, no. The deep sea doesn't have enough food for an animal that size. Uh, unless like, or at least not enough food for a vertebrate that size. Um, and again, they would have to be the kind of shark that survives in cold water, which is very slow moving, very slow aging. Um, so let's see where we are. Oh, good. I have another 10 minutes to blather at you about sharks. Um, so shark evolutionary journey. So that is what I decided to write this book on. What I wanted to do was I wanted to write a book about prehistoric sharks. Um, and I wanted to write a book that had prehistoric sharks all in one place. Cause like, for some reason, there are very few books um, of any kind, but especially picture books about prehistoric sharks. Like usually it's like, this is a book about the Megalodon. Everyone talks about the Megalodon. I don't know. Uh, this is a book about like this prehistoric shark. Um, or it's like there's prehistoric sharks in this book about sharks in general. Here's an ABC of sharks and there are prehistoric sharks in there. Uh, but there wasn't really a book out there that was like, and here are prehistoric sharks. Um, at least not an accurate one, which is a totally different rant. You can ask me about that later. Um, so when I wrote this book, um, I decided to do it chronologically. <laughs> <laughs> I decided to organize it chronologically. So what ended up, so the first one that we have 
is I'm gonna butcher these names just by being the author. So Claudia Shark. This is the first true shark. And it has like the shark, you can see it has like the shark shape. Um it's got kind of the long football thing. It's got the fins, it's got the tail. Uh, that was the blueprint. Incidentally, it's very difficult to describe the shape of a shark uh, in metaphor, I discovered. Because if you say it's football shaped and you're writing a book that's going worldwide, you have a problem because not everybody uses the same term football. And a soccer ball shaped shark would be hilarious. Um, I didn't really want to use torpedo either. So I had to figure that out. Buy the book and you'll find out what I did. Uh, so basically, yeah, basically sharks have the same basic shape, most of them, but it can get really, really varied. See, so we have like, we have a thresher shark here. We have a whale shark here. Um, you can see there's lots of variation. Uh, we have sharks scales. Uh, these are called, these are called dermal denticles. Dermal denticles literally means skin teeth uh, because they are, I kid you not, basically made out of enamel. They're basically the same substance as our teeth. Um, and they grow on the shark in these little armored plates. They can be different shapes. Um, and if you do a shark this way, you're okay. If you do a shark that way, you're gonna cheese grate your hand. <laughs> it's essentially how that works. And scientists think that's for um, protection and aerodynamicism. They also, all sharks have like a very thin layer of slime on them, which helps prevent uh, the adherence of muscles and um, like other shellfish barnacles, um, like you see on whales. So they are, let's see, looking at Devonian fish. Sharks are, um, so we have the skin, we have the shape, we've got the skin, um, and then we have the teeth, which I'm gonna, it's gonna take me a minute. Oh, well, let's talk about a skeleton, shark skeleton. Sharks are, skeleton is made out of cartilage. Uh, that's why they're called cartilaginous fish. Uh, it's cartilage, it's the same stuff in your ears and your nose. It makes it a lot easier to swim. It also makes it a lot easier to, a lot harder to fossilize. Cartilage doesn't fossilize well, which is why we only have like these certain fossils and things. Why we mostly have teeth and fins of fossil sharks, jaws sometimes. Um, this is my favorite prehistoric shark. This is the Hypotis. It's my favorite. Um, little spiny, little spiny boy. It's on my shirt. Um, the Hypotis is my favorite because they lasted a really long time. <laughs> um, they, they lived during the time of the dinosaurs and they survived for a massive chunk, I think, Two hundred million years. This shark was around for two hundred million years, and it wasn't just like it wasn't just like uh, I'm not around for two hundred million years because no one can fight me. Like this thing was about average size for a shark. It was about six and a half feet long, um, and it was in the water with like like pleurodons and. <laughs> Like, please, or I was like in the water with these massive marine reptiles in Jurassic, and and it was it 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 made it mostly because it was a really adaptable shark. 
um, scientists think they might have been able to go into fresh water. Uh, they had two kinds of teeth, like we do. See? They had flatter teeth in the back and sharper teeth in the front. Um, and they also had those spines on their back to help protect them. But I love it. I love a good, I love an adaptable survivor. Like that's always my favorite. I think I like megalodons in movies, but like being big is not a personality trait. I like an adaptable survivor. So teeth are what a shark is known for. And just like with any animal, you can tell what, um, what a shark eats by its teeth. Um, you have your, you have your pointy teeth, which are good for like your jellies, your slippery fish. Um, if you've ever seen the mouth of a garbling shark, it's a nightmare, but uh, that's because they're eating extremely slippery things they need to be able to stab. Um, you have your, you have your sawing teeth for cutting through bone when you're a great white or a megalodon and you gotta like eat those mammals, eat those sea mammals. Um, and they run, most of you know this, they run on a rotating basis. So like they keep pushing out teeth. There's always new teeth coming in the back. Um, so sharks basically, they really very much um, sort of rule in the Carboniferous, uh, which is the period of time when all the coal comes from. Um, and then they got, um, and then they were kind of more regulated to like mid-tier predators as time went on. Um, and then, Where was I going with that? Ah. But no, the point is that most of what makes a shark a shark, uh, whether they are the biggest thing in the ocean or just an important part of it, um, what makes a shark a shark hasn't, hasn't really changed much in hundreds of millions of years. Um, the newest shark innovation is uh, the hammerhead which hammerheads are relative babies in the shark world. They're only about 20 million years old. And their, um, their eyes being set right here means that they have a full 360 view degree view and depth perception in a narrow field front and back. Uh, but they also can't see like right here. Um, that's like the newest shark innovation. And so essentially like the evolutionary journey of sharks is, is I found something and it works and I'm gonna add stuff to it every now and then and see if that works, but mostly I'm gonna stick with what works. Don't fix it, it's not broken. It's basically the shark motto. Um, but there are a lot of really cool kind of side things and things that sharks have developed over the years or try or like that prehistoric sharks did um and you can read about them in the book and i think that's everything that i was going to say cool <laughs> do we have questions for miriam <clears throat> feel free to type them into the chat or just uh, pop up on the screen and ask shark experiences you've had hey rachel hi rachel Hi, Miriam. Hi. Um, I was curious, as you said that you really looked around and all you found were books that were kind of sp specific to one type of shark. Looking at everything that you've learned, is there mm -hmm. a shark that you would dedicate an entire book to? Oh, that is a good question. Um, I think if I was going to write an entire book about a shark, a single shark, um, I think it would probably be either the dwarf lantern shark or the lantern sharks family in general, um, because they're very cool. They're very tiny and they go in the dark. 
<laughs> um, because they live down in the twilight zone. Uh, the twilight. <laughs> no, it's called the twilight zone. Is it called the twilight? They don't live in the midnight. Anyway, uh, I'm like, wait, what is that called? Um, Research your own book for the answer. <laughs> I know that's the problem with being like sort of a jack of all trades nonfiction author is that like I have too much information in my head and it gets scramble scramble. Uh, we're just gonna call it the Twilight Zone for now. Um, they live down in the Twilight like level, um, and sometimes in the night zone, and they glow. And we don't really know a ton about them. And so I think it would be a really cool book to kind of talk about. Like I do talk, go into a little bit about um, bioluminescence and sharks in this book, but I just think like a family of tiny glowing sharks would make a good book. But the other one I would do is the cookie cutter. I would, I would write an entire book on the cookie cutter shark because the cookie cutter shark is the Loki of the sea. <laughs> <clears throat> And they are, they're the only parasitic shark. Oh. So, um, the, they're the only parasitic shark, which basically means that they like, they, they also have bioluminescence and they swim around with their bioluminescence and they're like, look, I'm prey. And sharks and whales are like, what are you? Are you prey? And then it's like, psych, and then it like takes like a big scoop out of them of like a blubber or muscle or whatever and then like some <laughs> um, <laughs> but the best part about them is is that they can't tell the difference between rubber and food so uh they have a long history of um confusing submarine operators <laughs> because they they'll bite like the wires and the equipment Ooh. And then they're like, is someone sabotaging our submarine? And like, no, it's just this stupid little cigar shaped fish. It <laughs> just looks like a sausage swimming around in the ocean. Like, I oh. right, thank you. <laughs> I would write a whole book about that. Oh, uh, how do you feel about frilled sharks? They they're amazing. They are look like evil um. Are those gloves that you use to take things out of the oven? Oven mitts. Oven mitts. They're, they look like evil oven mitts. Uh, and they're horrifying, but also like they're very cool and they're very old. So I appreciate like I appreciate a good survivor. Also, their teeth are super cool. Hang on. Let's see if I can. I knew I wasn't going to be able to get through this without looking at something on my phone. Uh, <laughs> Frilled shark teeth. Like their teeth, their teeth are ridiculous. Wow. Look at that. Is that each individual teeth serrated like that? I, or those rows of teeth? I think this is the frilled shark tooth. Oh, wow. And then the way that they go in the mouth is like, Okay, yeah, so that is so weird. Yeah, it's so hard to tell, but like, it looks like, I don't even know. They're, <laughs> they're just very strange. Those teeth look like they would hook onto anything. Right, yeah, no, because frilled sharks, um, frilled sharks eat squid. Oh. And um, animals that eat squid tend to be eldritch nightmares because squid are really slippery, squid and jellyfish. Squid are really slippery and they can go forward and back. So once you lock onto a squid, you don't want it to be able to wiggle out of your mouth. Um, if you wanna see another example of that, look in the mouth, look up the mouth of the leatherback sea turtle. They eat jellyfish. Okay. <laughs> um, so you get like, you wanna have a good grip. Any other questions? Hi, Miriam. <gasps> Last from the past. Hello. Hello. Uh, hi. Super excited about your you. book. My son Jackson is a shark fanatic, so we'll be getting it for sure. 
How many um, sharks are featured in your book? So there are 14 featured sharks. So um, basically the structure of the book is um, you have like a full spread for the whatever featured shark I'm talking about. This is the Stethacanthus. And then we talk about um, And then we'll have like a tool, like a toolbox section where it talks about something that sharks generally have in common, like how they reproduce, their skin, whatever, and like some other information. This one has a little sidebar on shark, shark migration. Um, so there's 14 featured sharks, but then there are other sharks in the other sections. Like these are, what are these? Tiger sharks, baby tiger sharks. Okay, Mama. Yes, love. Um, I, I want to ask you a question. Okay, I'm very sorry, Nikki. Hang on. It's okay. Um, um, uh, um, what's up? Oh, uh, hey, buddy. Um, uh, um, uh, 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 are these things, are those things broken or not? They're not broken. Was that the question you wanted to ask me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, are those sword tips? They're sword, they're, they're, so, I can, we can talk about it later. Do you have, want to say goodnight? But, but, yeah, 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 but what were you, were you about to say? <laughs> I was about to say that they're sword sheaths, but we can talk about it later. Okay, come on. Okay. Sheaths! Okay. Say goodnight to mom. I'll make hug. Big hug. Yes. I'm gonna eat it. Okay. Okay, let's go. Bye! I would feel worse about this if that, literally everyone who was here wasn't somebody I knew personally. Bye-bye! <laughs> Bye! Let's go. All right. I'm professional. We have um, a, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, oh, what country's languages are your book releasing in? Oh, um, so Abrams bought what's known as World English Rights, um, which is really common for picture books because you can't sell the art and the picture or then the words separately. So they're bundling them together and um, sending them around the world in English. Uh, but we did get an offer from France, which was my first foreign language deal. So Sharks and My New Eddie History will be published in French next year. Um, do you research through written materials only or documentaries or interviews? Everything. I don't, I did have a couple people that I emailed on like specifics, um, but I research, um, I pretty much do all of it. Um, I look at books, I look at documentaries, I look at um, YouTube series by scientists on sharks. There are some really good ones out there for like specifically geared towards kids. Um, uh, you know, I look at, I have a subscription to Academia EU. So I like look at scientific papers and Um, pretty much, yeah, pretty much the only thing I don't do is interviews, um, mostly because that involves actually talking to people. And, um, that might be something I do in the future, but I wrote this book in like 2018 <laughs> and I was, uh, I was raising a two-year-old and then there was a pandemic. And so like talking to people has not been either accessible or um, particularly like, it, yeah, this it just hasn't really been a thing. Um, but maybe I'll do that for my next book. Find someone to interview. Yeah, to answer Nikki's conversation, there's at least, there's 14 uh, highlighted charts in here, but there's a bunch more like in the, in the other areas. So um, I talk about, I have a spread about whale sharks, and then I talk about filter feeding. So I have like basking sharks and mega sharks in the filter feeding section. So, so. it's a fair amount of shark. And then in the back, oh, no. in the back, there's a, there's a list of more prehistoric sharks that you can look up if you want to. So. Cool. Any other questions before we say goodnight from anybody? 
Um, I have, we haven't figured this out yet in terms of when I'm going in to do it, but just so you guys know, there will be um, signed copies. Yes. If I come sure, over, to absolutely. Copies, yeah, they can that'd be great. Copies yeah. From you. Okay. Yes. You I'll guys the link in there one more time too. so you can go and order the book right now and then Miriam will come in and sign them. You yes, can personalization if you do that, I come in and sign it and then they send it to you. That's right. Yeah, or you can come pick it up if you live nearby. Or you can come pick it up. So if you guys if you guys order it from Annie's, um, I will go in sometime in the near future and I will sign it for you and then they can send it to you and you'll have a signed copy. Even cool? better. Love it. <sighs> no, I was just going to ask if we could buy it directly from your your bookstore so that's good absolutely yeah. yeah yeah there's a link on that uh event page to purchase the book so let us know how you would like miriam to sign it in the comments perfect all right then all right. well thank you miriam and everyone for attending great to learn about sharks such a beautiful book hope everyone buys it and enjoys it Thank you. Thank you guys. It was congratulations, so Miriam. It was so great. Yeah, to congratulations. See you. <laughs> All right. Good night, everyone. Thank Good you. Night.